Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. Uh, I don't know about you, Matt, but uh, I'm tired. Same. Uh, I I can talk about this a little bit later, but I, I was up till 3.30 in the morning trying to knock out a piece. I, I had an idea for a piece like on, I think it was Tuesday morning, and just like could not get any time to work on it so if, if you don't mind a slight digression uh so both both my kids have stuffy noses and uh they uh i, I kept one home from school and i kept and i didn't keep the other one from school because it wasn't as bad there's no fever or anything uh but uh she got sent home from school when she was stuffy in school, uh, and they all get COVID tests. I take them to get COVID tests. Uh, plus, it was my wife's birthday yesterday, so we were doing birthday stuff. Uh, and and kids were home all yesterday for remote school anyway. The Tuesday was in person. Wednesday was remote school. Point being, I just can't get any free time to work on articles, so I couldn't really get cracking until like eleven o'clock last night, and so. If I'm incoherent and rambling like now, uh, yeah. that, that's why. I'm incoherent, I think, for different reasons. I was up like late Monday night uh, talking to Brian Williams and early Tuesday morning talking to Morning Joe. But that was days ago. <laughs> but I still feel like a train hit me. And this morning when my alarm went off at 6 a.m. I have to get up with the kids and get them off to school. I mean, normally I wake up without the alarm and I just felt, and I probably, I got a ton of sleep last night. I probably like went to sleep at like 10 o'clock at night. Uh, so I had a good night's sleep and I, I feel like a train hit me. And I think it's that damn time change, Bill. Daylight, Why are we daylight, doing that? Daylight savings is an abomination. Uh, that actually is, you know, I'm writing for the Washington Monthly now a lot. And they're, they're, they had a piece in the fall uh, Basically, the, the science is that daylight savings is bad. Uh, well, here, okay, here's the thing. I like what we have right now, which is it gets dark later. So whatever this is, let's just keep this. No, you go the opposite way. Get rid of it. <laughs> no, no. Keep this, but never change again. Ne go back and never change. <laughs> who, who, who wants to be awake more? Who? The problem of America is not uh, uh, too little sleep. I mean. <laughs> Uh, the problem is not too much sleep; it's too little sleep. You know, we is we, your phone is your phone is that your phone or am I getting uh, every time I hear like a uh, a vibration, I feel like I need I, I have this anxiety come across me uh, that maybe, like maybe my phone is I'm I've vibrating and it's it's making my microphone rattle. Uh, but you, America is is a, an overtired country. We already are doom scrolling and Netflix watching, you know, into the wee hours of the night every night. We don't need to, like, start our bedtimes no. later and I, later I and later. I can't play catch with my sons at 6 a.m., but maybe I have dinner. After dinner, I can go for a walk with my wife, play a little catch with my kids before bed. If it's light at night later i'm not saying till 10 we're not this isn't alaska or whatever but i mean if it's if it's late if it's light till seven or eight that allows me outdoor time getting exercise getting fresh air with my children i, I don't need that at 5 a.m i don't need it to be light what am i gonna do am i gonna go go for a walk with my wife at 5 a.m that's not happening well if we all got to bed when we should go to bed maybe it would well Whatever the case is, I think you and I can agree. Wh whichever position you come down on, and I'd love to hear, you know, let us know in the comments. Are you a team Matt or a team Bill? Um, wherever you come down on that question, I think we could probably agree it's a stupid idea. Thanks, Ben Franklin, to keep going back and forth. I do agree shame. with that. If, if I had to people settle for accidents, I bet you people have. I bet you there's a higher rate of death like heart attacks and all sorts of stuff right now because of this. Uh, I agree with that. I mean, if I had to settle for uh, a compromise, I would accept what we have and, not, and no change. Uh, but but it's terrible for for kids. You, you, you parents who are trying to get their kids on a sleep schedule, then everything gets screwed up on the changes. Uh, I just find in the summer when the sun's not down to like, you know, 9.30 p.m., you try and get your kid to bed because they have to get up in the morning for, for camp or whatever. It's just torture. 
I mean, how do you get the kid to bed? I mean, I mean with young kids, you, know, you get, putting a kid to bed when it's daylight out is terrible. We do it. It, it is. It's weird. Um, but we have blackout curtains, mm-hmm. and I am. I am a. I'll say a Nazi. I am a hard ass about uh, schedules and about consistency and routine. So we have that down, but it is, I agree. It's, it's, it's a little weird going to bed when like, it reminds me of there's a Simpsons episode where Marge uh, looks out the window and like Bart's flying a kite at night. And she says, you know, there's something unsettling about that. And I feel similar, but opposite about there's something weird about going to bed. where like at a time when people are outside, like having barbecues and jogging and like, you know, having whatever, um, but we do it nonetheless. But listen, we need to, you know, why doesn't a politician make this happen? And I know Marco Rubio and others have probably talked about it. But if but someone, they, well, actually, I think, think Rubio has a bill. What's where, what's the progress on that? Bill? I'm sure it's bill. going nowhere. I'm sure it's, on the bill. <laughs> why doesn't this happen? Who is it? Who is is it? Uh, uh, who keeps down the electric car? Who made Steve Gutenberg <laughs> a star? Who is stopping this? From happening, what's the log jam? I, I, that I cannot tell you. Um, I mean, when I go for when I look to people who can do the legislative breakthroughs, the first thing that comes to my mind is Marco Rubio. So I don't know why. I don't know why he hasn't made the magic happen. But uh, we 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 are where we are. Well, let me just say, I'm cranky. It's we're taping this on Thursday, so this is what day five of this. It's not. It's not like it just happened. And it's only one hour, <laughs> one hour, and five days later, I'm still out of sorts because of this. Thank you, Ben Franklin, <laughs> who I think was behind this. Uh, and maybe it made sense when we were farmers. I don't know. Like I'm willing to accept. I'm willing to concede. Maybe if we were farmers, there may be some efficiency. I think that time has passed. I far, think that far, you know, farmers get up in the morning. I don't think the farmers need daylight savings time. <laughs> Yeah, there was something to do with saving energy at some point, allegedly. And like, you know, maybe the Washingtonian can delve into whether that was ever really a thing. <laughs> but, Bill, we, we've got bigger fish to fry yeah. right now. Well, you know, uh, I, I mentioned Marco Rubio, who um, played a very big role in tanking the last attempt at immigration reform in 2013 because he voted for the Senate bill and then came out against it and said, hey, House, don't don't take up the bill that I voted for. Uh, he didn't uh, just vote for it, Bill. He he was an architect of yeah. it. He championed it. He, he sold to- it to conservative talk radio pretty effectively at first, enough so that it passed the Senate. Why? And then I think he heard footsteps. Well, I, well, I think because he was not selling it effectively, the conservatives were turning on it, and he could he, no, he, he no, it was a an impossible task. I think he actually did a commendable job initially. It passed the Senate, but it took months and months. And during that time, do you remember the Marco phone? Do I need to go over this again? <laughs> I, I don't Are you remember familiar with the Marco. Phone? I don't remember the Marco phone. Okay, so Breitbart dot com wrote a story saying that there was something called a Marco phone in the immigration bill. And a Marco phone was a free cell phone that would be given out to illegal immigrants as part of the bill. Indeed, there was a provision in the immigration reform bill whereby if you were a rancher or a farmer living on the border and you didn't have cell phone access, you could be provided with a satellite phone to report incidents of border crossing. (laughs) That was the provision. But, you know, the line, uh, the truth is halfway across the world before, or a lie, uh, there I am tired again. (laughs) A lie is halfway across the world before the truth gets its shoes on. This became fact. The Marco Mm. phone, the fact that Marco Rubio wanted to give illegal immigrants Mm. a phone became (laughs) Back. Then that, and that's what I think Marco had some comments talking about how he was being distorted and the media was twisting his words. It was, it was this interesting moment when it was a Republican, the victim of misinformation from conservative talk radio, things that Democrats complain about constantly. Uh, but yet he didn't, but he, but he cracked and, and flipped the other way. Uh, and so what's happening right now with immigration reform is that Democrats 
are having a hard time getting on the same page. Uh, Biden in the campaign promised that his uh, he would have a sweeping immigration reform bill introduced on the first day of his presidency. He did that. Uh, and in the House, Democrats are very steadily passing you know, all, a lot of their big wish list items, you know, they got the voting rights bill, you got a labor rights bill, you got uh, LGBT equality bill, you have um, the police reform bill. All this is it's coming out. The House. Quit calling me Bill. <laughs> uh, all happening on party line votes, even though they know that it has rough, uh, rough road in the set. They're, they're saying that we're putting our marker down here. We're steadfastly for these things. We want to put them on the floor of the Senate. And if they get filibuster, maybe that means we get rid of the filibuster. Immigration reform, Pelosi cannot get her entire caucus to support Biden's bill. And so instead, I think maybe today, um, they're going to vote on two smaller pieces. They're going to vote on a Dream Act bill. So that would, uh, I I, I believe, give pathway to citizenship uh, to those who were minors when they came over illegally. Uh, And a farm people that are like. 30 years old at this point, yeah, right? Right, right. I mean, I, I don't know if offhand, like, what the what the date is, like, what, what cohort of people te- exactly qualifies. Uh, and uh, a farm worker bill, which would get uh, far- migrant farm workers uh, the ability to get green cards. It does not directly put them on a pathway to citizenship, but I think once you get the green card, there, there's a way to get it after that. But the bill itself stops short of pathway to citizenship. Um uh, now, Dick Durbin. So, they, so keep keep this in mind. There's definitely there's definitely a push amongst the immigration advocates to say, the hell with these comprehensive bills because they they inevitably mean compromise with Republicans on border security measures that we don't want, and we didn't even get it over the finish line eight years ago. Uh, so let's do the piece by piece, and the pieces have no compromise elements to them. We used to the Dream Act as it is, period. Uh, and Durbin told the Times, I don't think the Senate's going to go for that. Uh, so they're probably hitting a brick wall with this anyway. Uh, and it just says to me, if you can't get Democrats on the same page for the entirety of the agenda, the way you can for other issues... That's already indicating where this is going to sit on the list of priorities. Uh, yeah. Well, I, simultaneously, we've got another border crisis. Well, the, the, well, I think this is the exact point. So, I actually, I have, I have a piece in the queue uh, for us for the Washington Monthly. It's not, not up yet. It's still got to be edited. But uh, if Democrats just say to themselves, oh, you know, we, we still got the votes for this thing. You know, voting rights. We got we got the hot hand on voting rights. Uh, we uh, were committed on labor reform and police reform and LBGT equality. We got our ducks lined up there as best we can. Um, infrastructure is important to Biden. We got to push on that. We still got it on immigration, so we got to we got to we got to put it down on the list. Well, number one, that's what happened in Obama's first term. The immigration got put lower down the list and never got over the finish line, even though the Obama gave the consolation prize of DACA, the executive order for dreamers, uh, which has <clears throat> withstood the attacks of Donald Trump and still on the books. Uh, but Wait, that, I think Bill share predicted that don't freak out about, I, I, to, I told Democrats don't give away, don't give away the wall for DACA. Uh, don't assume you can't keep it alive in the courts. And uh, that, that advice of mine was, was spot on. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, but uh, so on top of the fact that you have pent up demand in the progressive base to do this. And so disappointing immigrant advocates again, I think would be very damaging. Number two, you have this border, border spike, you have this border crossing spike, and th- this is not the first one. We've, we've had these periodic spikes, you know, many years since the Obama administration in, and every time it happens, it becomes a big cable TV story and, rep- and, the nativist wings go ballistic, uh, and the when it's a Democrat in office, you got your hands full because you're you know with Trump it was hell yeah let's crack down let's put him in cages let's let's deter the uh, the 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 immigration pattern by by being hard asses 
Uh, which, which you know, th- but I think there is a sense that maybe that actually happened, and maybe Biden's election serves now as a magnet for people claiming asylum coming to the board. I mean, that may be. It's hard to know for a fact. It's not an unreasonable conclusion to make when the Biden people don't don't accept it. Uh, but it's not crazy to think, hey, we have a nice guy as president now. <laughs> maybe we won't get put in cages if we go over the border. <laughs> uh, but they're so they're so overwhelmed. They don't have the capacity. What, what's the opposite? What's the opposite of the madman theory of politics? <laughs> uh, they don't have the capacity to process the numbers of people who are coming in. And so, you know, Ro Khanna, the uh, progressive congressperson from California, was saying that what's happening now is morally unacceptable. You have Ilan Omar and about uh, two dozen other Congress people saying ICE needs to break its contracts with. Uh, state prisons and local jails to detain uh, detain people. Uh, so it's not like Biden's getting off scot free from the left on this. And you got the right saying you brought this on yourself, and now we and now we're being overwhelmed. Tucker Carlson's you know going off on another bender uh, that we're too we're overcrowded. Overcrowded countries are are terrible countries to live in. Never mind all the open space we have in the interior west. Uh, so my point is you can't punt on the issue the issue comes to you sometimes immigration yeah. is an issue that, that almost always comes to you and it's not going to be solved unless you have some broader reform and broader reform is going to require some bipartisan compromise because moderate democrats in these swing areas get very squeamish on this issue and they're not going to pass a party line bill and say bring on the filibuster because they're not on that page right now uh, so I don't think Biden can can easily wave a wand here and have this issue go away. He's got to deal with it, and he's got to deal with it almost surely in a, in a bipartisan way. All right, let me let me take that as an opportunity to go a little bit broad here. Okay, <clears throat> let me just set it up. Joe Biden's president, very popular, just passed a one point nine trillion dollar COVID relief slash stimulus act. Mm-hmm. He is about to unveil or preside over vaccines, which I, you know, which are going to, uh, I don't want to say completely end COVID, but I think we're, you know, spring is coming. Okay. (laughs) He's got the wind at his back, but um, there's also problems. We've got these, this border crisis happening. Um, It's not clear to me how many other things uh, he can pass via reconciliation. I'd love to get your thought on that without going nuclear, which seems like that's not going to happen. It seems like Joe, uh, Joe Manchin's not going to get rid of the filibuster. So is Biden going to kind of hit a wall in terms of things that he could pass? There's other things he can do. He can do via reconciliation, like hiking taxes. I'm not sure how popular that's going to be. There's also the chance of things that we have warned about here, like inflation. Um, but that gets really broad. Um, I guess the question is, has Joe Biden peaked? Or is he just, uh, is this momentum off to a, a great start? Well, I don't think he has earned enough political capital out of passing the relief bill that it makes any other bill easily fall into place. Uh, you know, it, it may be that his popularity is good enough that even if he doesn't pass anything else, he could help Democrats win seats in 2022 on the relief bill alone because the monthly checks for the for the kids will keep coming in and the vaccines will happen and the economy is in a good place. Maybe, maybe you don't have to do anything else. Uh, but to the extent that that will it does. I mean, it does seem like Biden. So the, the Trump hangover, Biden's likable persona, the the free money he's giving us. The fact that we're going to get vaccines and it's going to seem like and I'm not taking away anything from Joe Biden, but he has the wind at his back when it comes to COVID and vaccines. It seems like unless there's a variant, always throw in that caveat. But it feels like I mean, Biden could presumably coast for a while off of that. I don't know for I don't know if he can do it for two years, but he could coast for a while. Uh in theory, but at the same time, you, you have a lot of pent up demand on the left. There's a lot of things people want to get done uh, and a lot of frustration that's not getting done quickly 
because of the filibuster rule. Uh, but even that is uh, often ignoring or downplaying the fact that you Democrats are not a rock solid 50 in the Senate on a lot of these things. I mean, yeah. Even the voting rights bill, uh, which I think is getting the most attention from Democrats right now, it got, it got formally introduced in the Senate yesterday with 49 sponsors, not 50 sponsors, because Joe Manchin has stayed off of it. And he said the day before, I haven't even read it yet. Uh, yeah. And, and I don't is even that- so it seems like that's DOA, I'm assuming. Well, you know, there's some people like Sheldon Whitehouse that said the plan is to put H.R. 1, S. 1 on the floor of the Senate, bring on the filibuster, have multiple filibusters, prove the Republicans won't move and use that as an extra dose of pressure to get Manchin and Cinema, maybe others to crack on the filibuster rules. Now, Manchin has said... He's never, ever, 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 ever going to get rid of the filibuster. He said, you know, never. What don't you understand about never? He has opened the door to talking filibuster. Uh, and Joe Biden has now said he's for talking filibuster. Now, what's confusing, there's two things about, two things about this that are confusing to me. Uh, one is neither Manchin or Joe Biden have said explicitly that they would use the nuclear option to bring about a talking filibuster requirement now so so just folks they don't already understand joe biden's uh, i'm sorry joe manchin's the reform that he mentioned that he might be open to would be forcing people who want to filibuster to actually talk right so the way it used to be was the way you kept debate going was you actually debated you got on the floor and you talked about Either the issue directly or talking about random nonsense to uh, just to be dilatory. Uh, and it was around 1970, 1972, when uh, after you had a spate of filibusters by segregationists in the 60s, and every time that it happened, the floor was occupied and you could not do anything else. You could not pass any other bills. You could not confirm a judge. You could not confirm an executive branch appointment. Uh that got frustrating for the majority. And so the majority in the Senate said, let's get rid of this filibuster rule and modify it so you don't have to gum up the entire works to filibuster something and we can still right. get some stuff done around here. Yeah. So it was meant to help the majority, not the minority. Uh, and it's only in the past you know, 20 years when... Uh, the minority has said, wow, it's really easy to do a filibuster now. Let's do it a lot. <laughs> Let's do it as much as possible. It doesn't take any effort. Uh, and that's gone the, the people's attitudes to go the other way. Uh, so could the I mean, there have been occasions. I remember Ted Cruz reading Green Eggs, Eggs and Ham. Right. I, I assume if you want to force them to actually talk, you can. Is that right? Well, but you, but you, you have a cloture vote. I mean, uh uh, I mean, yeah. If you if you if you want to hold the floor, I think by and large you can. You just don't have to. Uh, no, no. But what I mean is, uh, well, anyway, I, I don't want to get into a parliamentary mm-hmm. discussion, especially since I don't know anything about it. Um, but I, I guess the thing is the the one th- the one reform that Mansion appears to be open to, which would be hard mm. to change anyway. But but it necess- it wouldn't even necessarily be helpful to the cause of Democrats. Is that... Well, wait, 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 wait. Well, so there's a few things here we got to tie together. So it's so number one, I don't know if Manchin would do the nuclear option for talking filibuster, and I think that matters because... Manchin is the only senator to have never voted for the no- nuclear option. There are three times it's happened now. It happened with Democrats in 2013 to get lower branch judges. It happened with Republicans in 2017 to get Supreme Court judges. And then there was something else done in 2019 for Republicans to expedite um, the confirmation process. Uh, Manchin is the only person to vote no on all three of those votes. Uh, and he's, and he's counted that fact. So would he be, would he, would he capitulate on nuclear option because he wants talking filibuster reform so much? Or would he say, look, I'd be we're talking filibuster if Republicans agreed to it. And we did it to, uh, with a two thirds cloture vote, which rules changes generally so require. Just, just to be clear, Bill. So the nuclear option would be. If a majority allows the rule, if a majority allows the rules to be broken, so the rules could be changed. Correct. Is that- Current okay. rule is a 
a, a cloture vote, and cloture is when you stop debate, a cloture vote on a rules change is a two-thirds standard, not a 60-vote standard. So you need 67 to end debate on a rules change and proceed to the final vote. The nuclear option is having the presiding officer of the Senate ignore that rule. The minority says, wait a second, you're breaking the rules, and a straight majority overrules the objection. And so you essentially bent the rules to change the rules. So it's uh, a loop. It's a loophole. It's a loophole that, that uh, allows this to happen. And, 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 but you would need, but you would need Mansion or one Republican, and you're not going to get that. Correct. So you need, you have to have Mansion. Correct. Correct. And, and and so once you create a situation where you can change rules in a partisan way, that very much changes the character of the Senate. I mean, rules changes aren't supposed to be weapons. The one party uses over the other. It's supposed to be a, a shared set of parameters that all parties abide by. Yeah, uh, and Manchin has been against that. So but it seems it seems like it, it seems doubtful that Manchin is open to persuasion because he's a smart guy and he's been around, and so this is an informed decision he's made to oppose, you know, eliminating the filibuster. Therefore. It seems like the only option Democrats have would be to play hardball with him, to really try to pressure him. And that seems like a risky thing to do as well. Well, well, well I, mean, I mean, the ultimate risk is that he flips, I mean, which would happen to Jim yeah. Jeffords in 2001, and then you no, change just, control of the Senate. I just um, interviewed a, a, a West Virginia reporter who says that's never going to happen. Joe Manchin is never going to become a Republican. He is the Democratic Party in West Virginia. Um, and so that's that's anybody who says that that's going to happen doesn't know West Virginia for what it's worth. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to you know, I'm not the greatest man manchinologist in the world, but I just think you can never totally discount cards that he has to play. He more than any other Democrat, he he could become an independent caucus of the Republicans and say, I'm sick and tired of what Chuck Schumer is doing and trying to make me do, and so I'm not giving him control of the floor anymore. I'm not a Republican. I'm independent. I'm not going to change my views on anything. Yeah. But un until Democrats realize they have to work across the aisle, Mitch McConnell's yeah. got control of the floor now. You yeah. know, take let, a Let walk. me throw, uh, uh, just to sort of support that theory, Bill, let me throw uh, some interesting data at you. Um, West Virginia... When Joe Manchin was elected governor in, I think it was 2004, something like that, the West Virginia, 60% of West Virginians were registered Democrats. Today, last month, February of 2021, for the first time, maybe ever, I don't know, since Reconstruction, whatever it is, for the first time in a long time, maybe ever, Republicans became the majority party in West Virginia. So, um, so Man Manchin can play that card, I think. And he's the only and, Manchin is the only statewide elected Democrat left in right. West Virginia. And I think he's got a tight bond with folks there. The just CNN just did a piece about a lot of West Virginians praising Manchin for the way how he handled the the stimulus debate. Uh, I mean, Manchin's in his seventies; he might not even run again. You know, I mean, he's, he, he is feels not, younger. He's just someone he, he, he feels like a forty. He feels like he's forty five, but he's <laughs> he's not. Yeah. So I still think we know. I mean, he he can do that in a way that other Democrats can't. Other other Democrats, if he did that, they would not survive in their states. He he can do that. But I just want to circle back to something else, though, because so so one, I don't know if he would go nuclear option. Um. He's also said, after he said he's open to talking filibuster, he also said, "Well, I'm never going to get rid of the sixty vote threshold." And that made some reporters say, oh, well, he's not getting rid of the 60 vote threshold. Well, that negates what he said about talking filibuster. If at the end of that talking, you still need 60, well, what's the difference? Now, I'm not sure that's the correct interpretation of that comment. Uh, I mean, under, so understand this. I mean, the way talking filibuster reform is supposed to work and the way it, it was proposed 10 years ago in a rule change proposal that didn't succeed but that Manchin voted for. Um, the idea is, I mean, I mean the 60-vote threshold is not supposed to be 60 votes on the final up or down vote of the bill. Though there are times when there are, you know, leader agreements to that effect. 
but as far as like the normal process is, you need 60 to end the debate, and then on the final vote, it's up or down, straight majority. But the the, the 60 was into the debate is a de facto right. requirement. Uh, the talking filibuster reforms generally have been you filibuster by talking and talking and talking by having 41 people on the floor who are doing that. But once you lose that 41, too many people go off to get a bite to eat or go to the bathroom. You can then the majority can then move to a straight up or down vote, simple majority vote. So or, or the majority could give up, too. I assume. Well, they they, they surrender and move, the move, towel, move right? on. Like, like okay, can... this is taking too long. Just move on. Right. Correct. Uh, so, I I just what Manchin has said doesn't automatically say to me yeah. his talking filibuster proposal would not eventually lead to a straight majority vote if the talking stopped. Um, yeah. Uh, but some people are, are are making that conclusion. I just don't know if it's correct. Uh, well, I so. Let me ask you this then. I mean, can, could one senator, could Ted Cruz um, filibuster and stop things? Or would you need, you're saying you need 41? You, you, you would need to have 41 on the floor. Supporting it. Supporting the filibuster to keep the filibuster active going. Partic- active participants? I'll, I'll, they're not all talking at the same time. It's not cacophony, well, but, but they'd be physically present. Uh, you know, there was one famous incident that I was just reminded of, uh, of by a Twitter follower uh, in the 1980s. There was a campaign finance bill uh, and uh, Republicans were trying to stop it uh, with that with with that tactic. Uh, and they moved to a final vote and Republicans uh, scattered. They left and they left the floor uh, during the quorum call so they wouldn't have a quorum. And the Democrats voted to arrest the senators and bring them back to the floor, which they which they can do. And most of them came back, except for Bob Packwood, who literally was carried onto the floor with three plainclothes officers feet first. Uh, And and Packwood was very proud that he he was was, was trying to hide in his office under a desk and they dragged him out. Wasn't there a a thing in like a a Wisconsin state house a few years ago where they left the state? And then there's that happened to text of the Democrats when Republicans tried to do a redistricting thing. Like there's definitely times this has happened in various legislatures. So it's a it's a card that can be played. Uh, I mean, you you need to have in a 50 50 cent, you need to have one Republican on the floor to ask for a quorum. Right. And while that person is physically there, you would have one because you got fifty-one. Then you gotta, you know, then you gotta turn tail and skip out. <laughs> okay. Let me, but let me bring it back to this. Either, you know, either Joe Manchin is gonna stick to his guns, and there's not gonna be, you know, we're not gonna get rid of the filibuster, or there's some long shot chance he supports a talking filibuster, but that would still require. I mean, that, that, the bar for passing anything, even with that, would still be hard. Republicans could muster 41 votes to stop a lot well, of things. This is another question. You know, uh, you know, the, Jonathan Bernstein, who's a political scientist who has a column at Bloomberg, was arguing, look, don't think if you get talking filibuster, you get to pass all of your stuff. Republicans yeah. can have a grand old time <laughs> occupying the floor and talking the night away and raising money off of it and driving Democrats bananas. Um you know, you don't think Republicans will hold the floor for months on end to stop HR one? You damn well they will. Uh, uh, and what I and they would stop everything else too. Well, exactly. I mean, there's there's incentive to do that because it, everything grinds to a halt. This arguably in, in a polarized environment, when uh, if, 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 this is why I think Democrats have their calculations mistaken. So they though you look at Republicans, they want to obstruct everything. They don't care about public opinion. They're nihilistic. They just want to destroy democracy and make Democrats look bad. You'll never be able to compromise with them. Well, then what's stopping them from holding the floor for two years and, and rotating out nine Republicans to go eat and take bathroom breaks so they always have 41 and driving Democrats insane? Uh, yeah. when, it, when, it, when I when I've mentioned that possibility, you know, Democrats said, "Oh, they'll never do it. They they don't have the stamina for it. They'll crack." 
Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. It may be, but just it's it's a hell of a bet to make. Uh, and it may well be that Democrats say, oh, we, we want these judges. We just can't do this forever. Fine. Yeah. Screw HR1. Uh, and the Democrats are getting it demoralized that the tactic didn't work. Now, maybe, right. maybe at that point, then said, you say, okay, talking filibuster didn't work. You already proved that you were willing to use nuclear option. Go all the way and get rid of the filibuster altogether, uh, which I think would probably be how this all ends up. We want, once, that's why it's called nuclear option. Once you do it, <laughs> You know, all bets are off. Uh, and now maybe Manchin and Simmer wouldn't crack, but one of these days, once that once you were in that kind of scenario, when so the votes if, yeah, were there, it, when you it, got it the trifecta that was big enough, you would get rid of the filibuster. Yeah. It could be years, but once it's a slippery slope, I think, it, maybe not immediately, maybe not soon enough to help Joe Biden or Democrats in the midterms, but it would happen. Um, but but let me so but let me just ask you this, okay? So we got the one point nine trillion dollar, uh, you know, stimulus uh, uh, rescue package. I want to be fair to both sides. Um, I think you. I mean, you could obviously ha- you could obviously raise taxes through reconciliation. Right. What else is there? Anything else Biden can do on a simple with a simple majority right now? I mean, it's you know, it's, it's taxes and spending. I mean, that's what you do the reconciliation. Uh, and yeah, you know, there's, there's some talk amongst immigration advocates that maybe we can do immigration mm-hmm. stuff through reconciliation. If we can show budgetary impact that they would do it. But I mean, I'm not the legal expert here. Uh, but I would think based on what happened with minimum wage, like showing that the budgetary impact exists is not sufficient to be considered yeah. a budgetary item. So I don't think they're going to get very much. You know, I think if you, if you say I want to, if you couldn't do the minimum wage, I don't see how you can do immigration. I mean, you can say we want to spend forty billion dollars on border patrol. <laughs> That's budgetary, but a policy this individual it now has legal status. Uh, that's not budgetary. I mean, it might have budgetary impact because it's called, you'll spend money on the green card processing. But it's not a budgetary item directly. So I don't think – so infrastructure you can do, a carbon tax you could do. Uh, so there are things that are desirable uh, 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 for voting reform, giving states money so they have yeah. the money for more voting machines you could do. Uh, so you could do infrastructure and you could raise taxes to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that's – I mean, is that the pl- – I mean, is that most likely what – because because he implicit in this is we have a bias toward action. There's a sense that you have to do stuff. And so wouldn't it stand to reason that maybe that's the stuff that gets done? Well, if the filibuster changes are no go or if you have talking filibuster and it doesn't help you, uh, reconciliation is what you're left with. Yeah. What I think the problem is now, I mean, Democrats had a hard 50 for pandemic relief, uh, and even a little more so with the child tax, child tax credit expansion. Uh, it's not evident to me that they have 50 in hand for anything else tax spending related because you have several Democrats openly saying, I'm worried about red ink. We have to start paying for things. Angus King saying, I'm not even sure I want to extend the child tax credit if we're not going to have pay for us. Uh, infrastructure, you know, Biden's talking somewhere in the realm of two to four trillion dollars and Manchin and others are saying, well, we need we need, we need at least some revenue offset for that. I mean, you could argue that re- infrastructure can pay for itself in some degree because it has an economic stimulative stimul- effect. But you're hard pressed to get Democrats to say that you don't have to pay for any of it, especially after you've, you've done so, so much now deficit spending for dynamic scoring. <laughs> bill. Well, I, I, I think Democrats generally agree that there is a there is a there is a level of dynamism. With Keynesian spending, it's just that it's not magic at all that you, you you do a deficit spend and you make more money at the end of the day. You don't have to do anything hard. I mean, that's why the the, the, Demo- the the Keynesian Democrats and the supplies of Republicans part ways. Uh, so uh, there's going to be negotiation around infrastructure that is not going to be simple uh, and may well require bringing Republicans in because Democrats won't be able to agree amongst themselves. 
Uh, and there's climate elements to infrastructure, which are which are, can be tricky. I mean, I think more so in the Republicans than internally with Democrats. Uh, but uh, so I, I, that's why Democrats don't have an easy path to 50 on anything at this point. I'm not aware of any bill that has 50 Democratic sponsors in the Senate right now. I, I mean, I, I, I haven't checked every last thing, but I, I don't believe that the stuff that's cleared the House has that in the Senate right now. Uh, so it sounds like the low-hanging fruit for Joe Biden. You know, he's gotten off to a great start. He's popular. But it it just, from talking to you, it sounds like, you know, it's, it's going to get harder. It's Not, definitely, definitely going to get harder to pass stuff. I think that is... Absolutely the case. I mean, there's, there's, there's no counter argument there, in my opinion. The question for Biden is what you have some political capital. You're still a popular president. How do you best deploy that capital to get things moving? Is it putting pressure on your fellow Democrats to not backstab you and do talking filibuster or do this through reconciliation uh, so the, the presidency maintains momentum? Is it putting pressure on Republicans in relatively purplish areas? Hey, I'm not just personally popular. I'm, I'm, I got ideas that people in your state like. You already went the wrong way on pandemic relief. Uh, I see in Politico that you have regrets about that, that you, that you misplayed that, that, that vote. Um, don't keep doing it because you're the one who's going to be in trouble if you keep doing it. Uh, but that's still setting a bar of 60 and putting pressure on Republicans to meet that bar, which Biden, to this way, uh, you know, Biden did now tilt towards talking filibuster here. I had a piece earlier in the week saying Biden's got to choose. What's the strategy? Is it a 60 strategy or is it a 50 strategy? Is it I can, I can make bipartisanship happen or we got to change the rules because it's not happening? Uh, and Biden has now, because on one hand, Biden went 50 for pandemic relief, but he would not overrule the parliamentarian and gut the bird rule. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's been kind of neutral in this debate. Now he's tilted one way on talking filibuster, which still seems to indicate I don't have a lot of faith yeah. that Republicans are going to come around. Uh, but if you're not getting anything done either way, yeah. Then Biden's, you know, relative neutrality is not working out for him and his political capital is going to erode because he's not getting the things done that he claims he can get done. All right. The parliamentarian thing. Yeah. Now, you know, Joe Biden is uh, a, sen you know, a longtime senator. He's an institutionalist, all that. But if he decides, like, if Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer agreed you know, we're going to break norms here. We're going to, like, give us everything we got. We're, we can't get rid of the filibuster because of Manchin. You know, pressuring Manchin would be counterproductive. Um, we are going to lean on the parliamentarian so that we can call immigration, uh, you know, uh, a spending <laughs> bill or mm -hmm. whatever, uh, and so that we can do it via reconciliation. Like, how much authority does the parliamentarian have? Is this is this like how many troops, how many divisions does the Pope have? What's this like? I mean, the parliamentarian, technically speaking, is giving an advisory opinion to the presiding officer of the Senate, which can be the vice president or be um, like Pat Leahy as president pro tem. Um, sometimes others uh, occupy that role when those people are out. Uh, but in a big in a big matter it would be Vice President Harris. Uh, and uh, so the argument from the the hyperpartisans was, you know, ignore the parliamentarian, run roughshod over her uh, and do what, what we want. Uh, but Manchin has said, no way, no how am I going to let you do that? I'm not going to let you gut the bird rule. So on one hand, if the presiding officer overrules the parliamentarian or ignores the parliamentarian, says, I, I issue this ruling and I, what I say goes. Someone else can say, point of order, you're violating the bird rule. Mm -hmm. But to override the presiding officer takes 60 votes, not 50. So in effect, Democrats can sustain 
what Harris so says. Even if Manchin did that, they could overrule. But then they would need Manchin's vote on the final, on final vote. Passage. So, so, so you can sustain right. the vice president's ruling in the short run. But if that angers Manchin to such an extent that he tanks the whole bill, what does it get you? Right. The question becomes: if, who, who wins that game of chicken? But I wonder if he would. Yeah, and I wonder if he would play hardball to that point. I could see it's possible he could throw a fit about violating. Throw a fit. I wonder if that's politically incorrect. Um, it's possible that Manchin could make a stink <laughs> about uh, violating the Byrd rule. And, of course, Robert C. Byrd being a West Virginian, maybe there's something there. Oh, he, he said it openly, that he is. <laughs> th th this is to defend Byrd's legacy. He is very quite open about that. He occupies Byrd's seat, and he's going to fight for Byrd's legacy. So it's possible that Manchin could make a stink uh, and object to, oh, to this and then vote for final passage as well. He could. He could. Uh, now, what do you think about this, Matt? So Mitch McConnell had a statement this week that if Democrats got rid of the filibuster, don't think this is going to get you all what you want. We're going to grind everything to a halt. You know, it will be a hundred car pile up in the Senate <laughs> and nothing's nothing moves whatsoever. Uh, is Mitch McConnell someone who, when he makes a threat, you should pay attention? Or is this an idle threat that he can't deliver on? Well, you know better than I do whether he could deliver on it. But I believe that Mitch McConnell, um, remember he warned Har Harry Reid, you know, be careful what you do right now, because there's going to come a time when this is going to, you know, this will come back to you. You know, it's like a karma thing. Mm -hmm. And so you can tell me the extent to which McConnell will have the leverage as a minority leader to grind things to a halt. But what I would attest to is McConnell's willingness to exact revenge and retribution, given the opportunity. Yes, you know, I, I, I can't answer the question with confidence i i did i bring i brought this up on twitter i got a bunch i i i sort of put it in the form of a question a bit of a bit of a leading question you know what's the argument that mccall doesn't deliver on his threats i mean from my experience i feel mccall does, does. He uh, does. Uh, and norm ornstein who is the well-known uh scholar at american enterprise institute uh which is a right leading institute but he is known as basically he's gotten more and more left over the years and has been very adamant that the Senate is broken. The Republicans have be become impossible to work with uh, and would like filibuster reform. He, he, he wants a situation where you don't need 60 to keep a filibuster going. You need 41 to keep a filibuster. You don't, you don't, need, you don't need 60 to end a filibuster. You need 41 to keep a filibuster. Um, that sort of talk, puts... about, talk about that, Bill. Uh, be, and I want to bring this up because um, I'm sure you listen uh, religiously to, to Robert Wright and Mickey Kals. Uh, and and their dialogue and uh, you were in invoked. Oh, uh, I was. I did not know. Bob invoked you uh, and 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 this idea. What's the difference between the majority needing sixty versus the minority need? Like, it, wh what exactly is the difference? I mean, it's it's more effort. You got to be on the floor. Uh, you got you got to you got to keep being on the floor. So I mean, you you can't go home for a recess. You can't go on a junket. You can't see your family at Christmas. Uh, I mean, so it, it's it's akin to a talking filibuster in that respect, without being quite as painful. That you're literally so the onus is on the minority, correct? Not on the majority, correct? And so yeah, and in that respect, you're you're owning the consequences. You know, the the news report is forty one Republicans block issue X. Um, and to that people read the news that they'll know that you're the one who's causing it. And the question is, do you want to own that, uh, that, that, uh, that scarlet letter? Um, but anyway, I has exchanged with Ornstein and Ornstein and he had a thread afterwards. We basically said McConnell is being, um, empty here that once you go nuclear, the majority can keep overriding all of your other procedural, uh, gamesmanship, uh, and again, I'm, yeah. I, I'm not in a position to, to, to question or say, I guess what I, what I don't know is just how much back and forth does that take? Yeah. Uh, how much time is gummed up 
you know, playing tit for tat. And here's the other complicated matter. To what extent do 50 Democrats play along? Right. At one point, does a mansion say, this has gone too far. I'm sick of that. We, we can't live like this. I'm not going to vote with you Democrats on uh, one-upping McConnell every step of the way. We need to get, I, I want to get back to 60 and my partnership, and this is the opposite direction. Yeah. I'm out. The other potential is that Mitch McConnell's revenge comes when Republicans retake the majority. Well, that's I mean, that's a given, and and this is what I find. I I, I had another exchange with people uh, uh, with people about this yesterday, because um, there's Stephen Dennis, who's a reporter at Bloomberg, if I remember correctly. He's been in a few different places. But I think he's at Bloomberg now. Um, he said, well, you know, "Give me an example of." a use of the filibuster in the past 20 years that was a net positive. And I said, Social Security privatization. That's how the Democrats blocked because they had filibuster power. This is in 2005. This is right after George Bush won re-election, felt he had a mandate, put it into Social Security privatization, got bupkis. Uh, well, I, I, my recollection is that it would have allowed us to put a portion of our social security Correct. into private investments. So you, can say, you can say partial privatization if you, if you think it's more accurate. Um, but from a Democrat. But you're assuming that it was a, a positive, that it was well, stopped. Yes, I, I, I do. I would say most Democrats do. Okay. <laughs> sure. and, and who knows? I mean, certainly with the Great Recession, it seemed like a good thing that we didn't do that. However, in the long run, it very well might be that the well, number one, Social Security could, like, go broke. And number two, it could be that owning, you know, a portion of that money that in the long run you will end up having more money at the end. Uh, anyway. Look, let, let's, not, uh, let, let's not debate Social Security right now. Let's say for another you day. Just, you just casually assumed that it was a bad well, – that but, it was a – But, but from, a, from a Democratic perspective, that was one of the great victories – during the Bush presidency, that that got stuffed in Bush's face right after he won re-election. And I'm pointing out that that you cannot assume that happens without having filibuster power. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to me, that's just a dead obvious point. But I got a bunch of people in my feed arguing, oh, it, it wasn't the Senate. Uh, it was Pelosi in the House. Uh, oh, even if there was no filibuster, Republicans would have never done it because it was so unpopular. And I just don't think you can make those assumptions. I mean, so but we, so we should understand the order of events here. Uh, you know, Bush was right out of the box after the election. He said very bluntly, "I have political capital and I plan to spend it," which is kind of a weird thing for a guy to a guy who sort of knows being a folksy Texas politician to talk about a a academic concept like political capital. Uh, but he did, uh, and right away. And Democrats had a bad congressional election that year. They had only 45 senators, uh, including their independents. Uh, but, you know, Republicans needed 60 to get something out of the Senate. Uh, and, uh, and and there were some D Democrats who were a little partial to something along these lines. Uh, and were, you know, even Lieberman was sort of openly musing about it a little bit. Uh, so it, it took some work to get Democrats unified, but they, but they, but they by and large were. And by January, there was news reporting saying Republicans are aware that they can't beat a Democratic filibuster. And so they, they needed to find Democratic support to make this happen uh, in both the House and because the House Republicans didn't want to vote for something they knew wasn't going to go anywhere and was politically dicey. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it never polled well. But uh, in a world where you, you don't have the filibuster, uh and the conversation is a Republican-only conversation, like the relief bill just now is a Democrat-only conversation. The media coverage is totally different. The polls of the debate are totally different. Uh, and even though Pelosi did you know, a bang-up job keeping her caucus in line and preventing any fissures from showing, the point where it was clearly dead was when 42 Democrats signed a letter expressing their opposition to any kind of privatization. That's when Republicans knew we're done here. This can't go anywhere. Uh, and there's been reporting to that effect and, uh, yeah. that, that, I, that I point to. So there's, these people think that 
uh, you know, Iglesias at Vox wrote a piece saying, you know, thank Pelosi for saving Social Security. And people sort of grabbed that article to think the Senate was irrelevant to the process. That is just just factually wrong. I mean, just, just not what happened. Uh, no, another, and, another point. Well, another so, point so, 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 let me say one, one last thing quickly, though. Let's say the Republicans in 2005 were sensitive enough to public opinion that they wouldn't do it, even if they could. Uh, I don't think you can assume that today's Republicans are so public opinion sensitive that they wouldn't ram it through the first chance they could. There's a there's a narrative amongst de- Democrats that Republicans don't want to pass anything anymore. They just want tax cuts and judges, and that's all they care about. And that's why McConnell didn't get rid of the filibuster in 2017, because he doesn't care about passing anything else. And I think Republicans got a wealth of ideas that they would love to get <laughs> through, given the opportunity. And if you think Republicans are so terrible, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't test the proposition of what they might come up with given the, the chance to do something without without a filibuster. And I was just going to say, I think there's a, a narrative that the filibuster is, you know, a racist institution that was used by segregationists. Um, but Bill, I think you've made this point that the filibuster was first used by civil rights champions and abolitionists, oh, maybe no. even. Well, not, I, I, um, I don't know at first... Uh, I think there was an attempt. Before segregationists used. I think there, I think there were examples of that. Um, I'm trying to remember. What, if we're not having yeah, the, we need it, to do whatever the case may be. I, I'm I'm confident that uh, it has been used for um, civil rights and not just to deprive them. Now I think it is totally fair to say it has been. It was most effectively used by civil rights opponents and for a very long time. Uh, it's not accurate to say that it was created for that purpose and it's only been used for that purpose. Uh, I mean, it is still it's a, it's a rule, uh, and any rule can be used by anybody, any time, for any purpose. Yeah. Uh, philosophically, it's philosophically neutral. Correct. You know, it a gun can be used to protect your family or to murder somebody, um, but it is uh, you know, guns don't kill people. Let's go there. <laughs> I, won't go, I won't go quite. I won't go quite there. I think that's uh, what you're saying. I think that's what you're saying. Um, I'm with you. And so to to just to focus on when it was used for malevolent ends, and just forget about when it was used for positive ends, I just don't think does the debate a, a service. Um, you it, you have to at least grapple with the complexity of the subject. I mean, you can still come out the other way. Yeah, and say well, the debate. The, the debate should be on the merits, and yeah. the question is: Should the Senate be a majoritarian institution, you know, majority rule, or should uh, the minority have the ability to stop things? That that that's a valid debate to have. I think that the founders clearly intended it to be uh, what is this, the saucer that cools the tea. Although, you know, the, the filibuster wasn't. <laughs> Originally, I mean, the filibuster was I mean, not fili- handed down from God. I mean, filibuster is not in the Constitution. Um, there is there are comments that the founders made that they thought things should pass the Senate on a majority vote, um, but there was very very early use of dilatory tactics. You know, some people say the filibuster started in you know eighteen thirty seven, uh, which is technically true. But there was an example of of trying to talk a bill to death. It wasn't it wasn't called a filibuster, uh, but there was an attempt to do that like right out of the box in like seventeen ninety three. Uh, it didn't work, but it was tried, and, and there even are examples of it being used in like in like ancient Rome. So it's not like the the, the concept yeah. of dilatory tactics was invented mm-hmm. in the 19th century. That's not true. Uh, you ever seen the movie uh, Amazing Grace about William Wilberforce? You, you've mentioned it to me before, but I have I've not seen it. It's really good, and in fact, I think the movie Lincoln and very is, I I would suspect that the people who made Lincoln was it Spielberg, whoever did Lincoln looked I think to Amazing Grace, but you know, it's not really the filibuster per se, but it's like the quorum call. And basically the way that they banned the slave trade in Great Britain, according to the movie, uh, is um, they, uh, the people against slavery, you know, they basically found a way to throw a party and get most of the members of parliament otherwise occupied. uh, And then all of a sudden, hold a vote, you know, hold the vote when when everyone was was uh, absent 
Um, and so there has been obviously the idea of of trickery uh, and of uh, of kind of playing with this is is not a new idea. Uh, so this is the example I think you were referring to. Um, uh, there was an example of the anti-slavery radical Republicans that used a filibuster um, uh, in Lincoln's day. Uh, uh, the radicals who opposed the Louisiana regime because it did not give African Americans the vote worked in close cooperation with the Senate Democrats who wanted to deny the suffrage to blacks. They shared only opposition to recognizing Lincoln's government in Louisiana. Uh, because of pressing business that the Senate had to attend before adjourning, Turnbull was forced to give way and the admission of Louisiana uh, was defeated. And so, I'm sorry, I, I skipped the, the line earlier. It's saying, uh, joining, joining Wade Grimes, if you were the radicals, Charles Sumner began a filibuster well, against Tommy recognizing Lee, was, Louisiana. Was that Tommy Lee Jones? I'm a movie guy. Tommy Lee Jones played Thaddeus Stevens. Oh, you're right, um, you're right. Uh, so joined by Wade Grimes, a few other radicals, Charles Sumner began a filibuster against recognizing Louisiana that often deteriorated into an angry shouting match with the president's supporters. He blasted, this is Sumner, he blasted the pretended state government in Louisiana as a mere seven-month abortion, brigada by the bayonet in a criminal conjunction with the spirit of case and born before its time. So, uh, that, the, so wait, Charles Sumner was the guy who was keen. Correct, correct. Okay. Uh, so that is an example <laughs> Of it used before Jim Crow, but it's, again, it, it, you, it's only fair to say that the Jim Crow force is used in far more uh, frequently and, and, and successfully. Um, uh, so, but, but I, I think the overarching point is that it's a it's it's a tool, it's a neutral tool. Uh, it can be used by any any side. Now, there's an argument that progressives want to pass more stuff than conservatives, and therefore obstruction serves conservative ends more than progressive ends. And again, I. I don't think that gives conservative ideas their due, but I understand uh, the point. And the, and the, and the, and the uh, parallel argument is, well, let's say conservatives get in there and they pass a bunch of horrible stuff like Social Security privatization that's unpopular, and then they lose the next election because of it. So what? You know, that's majoritarian government at its finest, and that's the way things should work. And the thing that I, I, I feel that's too pat because I, I think Republicans could pass like 20 horrible things – and maybe Democrats aren't able to collect the votes to restore all of them because we we don't right. live in a perfect world where every individual citizen is aware of every individual policy choice or the badness of them. It, like you could pass those screen privatization and the stock market goes gangbusters for the next three years and no one wants to repeal it right away. Right. And the problem doesn't occur until twenty years later. Yep. Uh, so totally. Th that, well, and then th there's also the problem of like you pass Obamacare, but then it gets easily repealed and then you pass privatization but then it gets repealed i mean that's a lot of uh that in and of itself would be problematic right well, I mean, and, and this is why so i Damn. don't i don't like pure unadulterated you know small d democracy that you know every impulse of the electorate at any given moment gets instituted right away because those, those, those impulses are based on incomplete information and you want to give ideas time to work. You want to give time for reformers to get kinks out. And, uh, and so if you're in a situation where every pendulum swing, bill passes, bill repealed, bill passes, bill repealed, that, that to me is a very destabilizing environment. So that, that, that's why I don't come out on that side of things. And I just, and, and, and I think we should be, debating the subject with all of the data points don't just take the bad stuff and ignore the good stuff uh because you're not going to have a complete and fully formed debate in that in that regard i think i just found the clip of you i'm putting up on twitter <laughs> okay. they're gonna hate you for this well that's that's uh that's that's my job um was there anything else we we're going to talk about we've been going for about an hour i think i think we let the, the rest for the parrot room uh all right. A bottle episode? I don't know what we call it. This is a very self-contained one, one big kind of one big gooey topic, but I, I think it worked. It's a good episode. <laughs> uh, what do you got to plug, Matt? Um, oh, let's see. You know what? People should check out my YouTube page. Um, uh, I think it's youtube.com slash Matt Lewis. And uh, always listen to the podcast. Matt Lewis in the News on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. We're now on Amazon, Bill. Wherever fine podcasts can be can be heard. Uh, how about you? 
You know, just yesterday I recorded a interview for the podcast My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, which is one of the great history podcasts. And so I was very honored that I got uh, asked to do it to talk about when America oh. worked and talk about uh, – the pilot episode of Edward on Edward Satinius. I still got to get, I still got to get done the second episode, but as, uh, uh, are Bruce, we, have you, have you announced the subject or is this a secret still? I think I have said that it's going to be about Shirley Chisholm. Uh, so that's yeah. not, so, so not a secret. Uh, there's a lot of Chisholm stuff coming out. So I kind of want to get to it and not, not, not get scooped on anything. Uh, although I'm pretty sure what I say is not going to be echoed with, with in, in other, in other, uh, tellings. Uh, but, uh, uh, Bruce Carlson was very nice and said, you know, look, you know, these are laborious podcasts. I know it. You know it. You know, get it done when you get it done. Do it right. Don't sweat about, you know, cranking them out, you know, too, too That's speedily. How you great, man. So I think that installment will come out around the end of the month. So just keep an eye out for that. Excellent. Good stuff. Uh, we'll probably be doing our DM Zoom tomorrow. And uh, these are great conversations. Um Last time we started off by talking about our writing process. How do we come up with how do we come up with columns to write? And and uh, one of our, you know, um, what do we call them? Uh, share, uh, shareholders is that what our fans are called? Zoomers, or DM Zoomers. I think, we call them, I think we call them shareholders. We do but whatever whatever the DM Zoomers are. Um, basically said, uh, I would love to be a columnist, but. I just don't think anybody would care to read my opinion. And I was like, don't let that stop. Like, <laughs> like, you think, if I thought that, do you think I'd be in this profession? And, and you and I ended up going for about 10 or 15 minutes on the writing job and the process before we turned it. And so that's the kind of thing you would get if you were part of these DM Zooms. Uh, and you can be by, uh, you know, wet, wet, wetting our beak a little bit, just enough to keep us going to support Bill's podcast project and my podcast project. And Bill, how could they do that? Uh, go to our Patreon pages, Patreon slash Bill Share, Patreon slash Matt, is Matt Lewis or Matt K. Lewis? Matt Lewis. Matt Lewis. Uh, and, you know, it can be a buck, can be, can, can you go lower than a buck, can you do a penny, I don't know. But you, it can be as little as you, as, as Patreon allows you to do. And then you have a VIP access to the DMZ Zooms. For for the price of a cup of coffee, you could support this struggling podcaster. Uh, check it out. Be a part of these awesome conversations. And, and think of it. You owe us for all of the free content that we've been giving you for, what, a dozen years now, Bill? I don't know. It's coming something like that. I, I got to check the, my, my anniversary list to where, to where we are right now. We didn't have kids. We were like... You know, we didn't, our kids are like old now. And, and we didn't, you know, anyway, we can hash out on our 15th anniversary some of this. But during the time we've been doing this, they've, uh, they've grown up. Speaking of, here yeah. we go. It's lunchtime. We're already late for lunch because we have to say to some FBI agents to give a presentation. FBI so, agents? Yeah. Well, oh, big Don't days. Talk. Big days in middle school today. Um, all right, I gotta, I gotta make, uh, make some lunch. My advice is Bye. do not talk to the FBI. But anyway, <laughs> see you Bye. next week in the DMZ. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.